631, we might make a start. Um, welcome everyone. We're really pleased to be able to host this with all of you to fill you in on what's been going on. But I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm joining from the unceded lands of the Jajawurrung in what's now called the, the Central Highlands of Victoria and pay my respect to elders past and present and offer my ongoing commitment to heal country here. And I invite all of you to put the country you're joining us from in the chat um, and normal um, normal sort of protocol applies of uh, keep your sound off, but your cameras on if you can so that we can see each other, but understand if you can't, if you're eating dinner or undressed um, the or don't have bandwidth. That's another good reason. Uh, so we are going to get straight into it because there's a lot of information to get through. And um, I think some of you are joining perhaps for the first time uh, for one of our solidarity sessions. We've been we've been hosting these since the start of the pandemic. It actually, in the time when when the lockdown started, it was a really good way to be able to still get together and organize and collectivize and act on things that were continuing, even if we couldn't go out and be together. And they were so successful, at a way to keep um, collectivizing and organizing that we've just kept, the, kept them going. Um, and they've been on, a range of topics from community supported agriculture to um, uh, what does what does it work to be farming? What does it mean to be farming on unceded lands and biodiversity beyond the shelter belt? There's heaps of them and they're all on the AFSA YouTube channel. So you're welcome to go and have a look at some of the past ones if you haven't seen those. I should have said, by the way, I'm Tammy Jonas. I'm the president of AFSA. And um, tonight we also have with us, Jess is behind the uh, logo. Um, Jess is the general coordinator for AFSA and um, the engine room really of our work. And we're all very grateful to have Jess on board with us. Eliza from Broad Ground is here with us. And Eliza, I'll talk about it later, is going to host a session in May that's going to be a follow-up to this session. Um, Adele is here with us too from the National Committee up in the Northern Rivers. So um, nice. To, and Morella is with us too here on Jara Country as well. So it's great to have a number of our committee members and Jess with us. Um, I've also got some of my fellow farmers, Josh and Rex here as well, who are farming. Neil, are you coming? Oh. You um, right. There we go. Um, so it's nice to see you all, even if it's not for necessarily a particularly good reason. I'm going to launch straight into a little bit of the history of what got us to this discussion of a license to a proposed license to sell letters. Um, and um, there may be, just so you know, there could be government um, representatives present in the session tonight. So um, just be conscious of that and say things in the way that I think is respectful, because I think most of the state governments, in my experience, who have had this for Sands ruling kind of handed down are actually also concerned about the impact, the negative impacts on small scale growers. And so one of their tasks is going to be to work on implementation at the state level so it doesn't adversely affect small scale farmers in particular. Um, I'm going to share my screen. If I can remember. There we go. And let's see if I can still remember how to do this. Okay. Um, so how did we get here? Um, the timeline is, uh, basically in 2011, the, uh, Fasans proposed a review of foodborne illness associated with selective, um, selected ready to eat fresh produce. But by 2014, their research had brought them to the stage stage where they said, you know, actually the way this is being managed in Australia is quite safe. And we're not concerned. We have high, they actually said in their documentation, we have a very high level of confidence that the food um, that is being produced in, in uh, horticulture is safe. So that happened in earlier in the first decade, in that decade. By 2019 though, there were a number of food safety outbreaks uh, between 2014 and 18. We'll go through those in a minute. And so 2019 saw a return of this idea of reviewing the food standards code, specifically around primary production, specifically around horticulture. By 2020, and AFSA put in a, that was the first time we put a submission in to say that we had really serious concerns about the introduction of some kind of licensing regime that would impact small scale market gardeners. Um, 2020, they did the second round of this review basically and came in with a proposal to introduce new standards for um, what they call high risk horticulture, which we'll talk about in just a second. And even though we put in submissions and so did the Victorian Farmers Markets Association and several other bodies that represent smallholders, um, 
2022, the bad news came that they were introducing three new standards for berries, leafy greens, and melons. Um, though, so they actually, in the original idea of um, high-risk horticulture, it also included sprouts and um, ready-to-eat minimally processed fruit and veg. Sprouts are actually covered under another code already, so they that's now been taken out of what's come into the standards. And they're mostly concerned about Listeria salmonella and Campylobacter. Obviously, E. coli sits there as well. But noting in their own documentation, they um, acknowledge that only 4% 4, 4 of foodborne illness between 2001 and 5, it was the data that they used, um, is from fresh produce. It's mostly from, you know, actually it's mostly chicken and eggs is where most foodborne illness comes from and dairy. So um, the case mm -hmm. for increasing regulation on horticulture seemed weak to us. So we did a bit of research about those outbreaks in 2014 to 18, and we put this in our submissions to them. Of the outbreaks that occurred, um, the frozen berries ones were entirely from imported berries. And so increasing um, restrictions on primary producers would not actually fix that at all. Hmm. Um, mm -hmm. The pre-packed letters, and I think somebody's not on mute. Um, Pre-packed lettuce and rock melons were both coming from really vast um, scale monoculture farms. And they. the important point here is not only that they're from really large scale monoculture farms, but that they have existing QA programs because they sell into the major supermarkets. And one of the things that the, um, the government was considering, the Fasans was considering is uh, whether if you have an existing QA arrangement with a supermarket, for example, you should be exempt from any new standards brought in because you're already covered under the QA program. So we pointed out in our submissions that you would therefore, if you introduce a new um, standard that applies to market gardeners like those here tonight, you would not actually have addressed any of those who brought us the outbreaks um, in the four years in question. We also pointed out to them that conventional supply chain, that, 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 um, flow chart on the top of farm processing distribution, retail food service consumer, that's theirs from their um, review documents. And then we we said, well, this is what ours look like. They go from the farm to the Asia. Um, there aren't three other stages in between. So the three new standards that did come in last, well, they haven't come in yet, sorry. They've been gazetted, which means they have 30 months before they will come into effect. So January, 2025 is when they should come into effect. Um, we have cons concerns, particularly on, I guess, two levels. One is, will these standards, um, how much will it cost for people to get a license under these standards? You know, if you have to register your market garden as a primary producer of horticulture of these particular high risk um, items, what will it cost you to do that? And what will be the auditing regime to see that you're meeting their standards? The standards themselves are... Um, the, I think Jess might have shared the link already, but the standards themselves are not particularly onerous. They're mostly things you're already doing, you know, about ensuring you have clean water sources, that you have a clean wash up station. Um, and it's they're not overly prescriptive in, in most of them. There is this one that worries us in particular, though, about minimizing the presence of animals. And uh, as agroecological farmers, we all think that that's a really problematic approach to producing food to exclude animals just carte blanche from. Uh, agroecosystems. So while we accept the need to manage risks of integrating animals um, in crops, because there could be pathogens from animal manure, also from compost and other sources, also from contaminated water in other ways, um, but we reject the notion that um, ecosystems should be simplified and monocultures are somehow safer. And we pointed out to them in our submissions examples like um, the, the much sort of touted duck rice fish systems across Asia, which the Food and Agriculture Org Organization of the, F um, of the UN constantly points out as a really healthy agroecosystem where the role of the ducks is literally to shit in the water to fertilize the rice. You know, so the, the idea that it's inherently dangerous to have manure around food production is nonsense. Um, so our final recommendations after they said they were introducing the standards was that now that we've lost the case and they are going to introduce these standards, um, that there's a fee-free threshold at, at a bare minimum. So that if you are a very small scale um, producer, 
you would not at least be charged a fee, even if you do have to register. That's our kind of bare minimum holding ground. Um, we also actually say that there shouldn't be a licensing nor audits required if you're selling directly. That so if to give you an example of how we achieved that in Victoria in the planning scheme for pastured pig and poultry, when we fought those battles in 2018, we managed to win exemptions from a number of requirements because of the low risk nature of small scale pig and poultry farming as compared with sheds and pigs and poultry. So the, there's an argument to be made for an exemption um, from licensing or auditing. And instead, governments could come up with, um, with guidelines and guidance, basically, to support growers rather than um, licensing and registration. And then the third one, of course, is that we don't agree with prohibiting animals. We think there should be guidance about safe management of integrated systems. So now I'm going to stop talking. I just want to make sure you had all the information without having to read all of the submissions that we've put in on this issue for since 2019. Um, and and what we thought we'd do is a bit of a Q and A, and we're going to, we're we're taking notes as well as this being recorded to capture what already applies to you if you're market gardening. Um, what guidance would help you, if any. And do you have thoughts on how you could directly, um, how you could demonstrate the safety of your systems without being licensed or having to pay a registration fee? And then we'll tell you next steps because there will be a, another one of these sessions for members only in May to get more information to help in our lobbying efforts with the with the government. So I will stop sharing my screen, but, oh, or should I leave that there? Is that helpful? I don't know. I wanna see your faces. share. Oh no, stop share. There. Actually, maybe Jess could post those questions in the chat instead so that people, I can see then if people raise their hands too. So the first question is just, um, do you, how many of you are already subject to food safety regulation um, of some sort for your systems? And, and I mean, I think there's the ones like Street Trader when you actually get there to do the selling, but how about any primary production standards? Is anybody in any state already subject to certain primary production standards for market gardening? No. no? So this would be a complete change for all of you. Yeah. And, you know, we've done some sleuthing. We can't find a single outbreak from a small scale market garden. Like it's, it's not a thing. So, um, well, that means we can go to the second question. So, I mean, I think as a, as a pig and cattle farmer with a butcher shop here on the farm, I know that when I started out, there were things that I didn't know about food safety that I had to learn. And I had to, you know, go seek that information out by working in a butcher shop to get some more skills. And um, also just by reading a lot, I guess that second part is, so what, especially for people starting out, what kinds of food safety guidance do you think would be helpful to market gardeners? Um, which could be, that could be supplied by, you know, the, the industry body, so to speak, like ASA. We can provide that sort of thing, just like APL and MLA do for livestock farmers, um, large scale that is. Um, what are some of the key things you think you needed to know when you started market gardening or that you still would like to know more about? Um, I grow in High Arm Ange uh, yeah. from Port Douglas. I'm a microgreen grower. Um, and no, I'm just, I'm sort of just starting up, uh, but I have been in operation for over five years. Um, but uh, I use soil um, as well. Um, so it, it's, uh, I make my own soil, which I'm just starting to do now. Um, so I'm just saying with regard to that, will that be something iffy um, if I'm using compost um, would that be something that I'd have to look into yeah like would they be asking for testing of it or anything yeah That's, yeah yeah because yeah. yeah, I do test my own soil um, as well um, and I'm, I'm using a, a green waste uh, from a restaurant um, which has been like a um, uh, broken down into uh, a, a liquid tea and then the humus like so I'm getting this off a, a friend who started up this business 
um, which is awesome. So I just really want to be in that circulative uh, economy, like yep. and um, yeah, and use the way. So that um, when I heard about this, so I was just um, wanting to be interested to see if I'd be under the hammer or. Yeah, so I mean, the way the standard's written right now, it it talks about making uh, something that would make the food unacceptable. And I had to go searching for quite a bit to find the 4.1.1 because it's not sitting there in the same page with the 4.2.7 and 8 and 9. Um, and it basically, it's it's a bit problematic, the unacceptable thing, because on the one hand, it's something that would make somebody sick. Fair. Okay, good. That makes yeah. sense to me. But one of the criteria for unacceptable is something that makes a product look un, look or seem um like unpalatable or not fit for human consumption to a reasonable person. Okay. But that's like people at the supermarket not liking a <laughs> too much curve on a banana, right? So what's the what's the um what's the go with that? So those reasonable person tests can be really problematic because like in in meat we get it with dry aging meat, right? So there's often um some mold in a dry aging process that is cut off the end product but a reasonable person might not understand that part of the process. So that that's a risk, I think, in terms of the horticulture test for what's acceptable and unacceptable, not mold specifically, but, but what people perceive to be um, fit for consumption or not. Um, but that's, it's a good question about the, um, what would they make? I'm sure they'd make you test under this regime, uh, whether that's reasonable or not at the size, the, the scale that you are, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Jess is taking notes, but I have a habit of doing that too, just so I. Who, is there a question? Um, who, yeah. who, who's, who makes that call if it's fit for human consumption? Like a lot of the salad mixes you see in any of the large chains don't look that fit for human consumption. So what like who's policing that like where does that come into it yeah so that the risk there is that it would happen in in audits um and as somebody who's been audited for 10 years i can tell you that auditors aren't always reasonable people even though i think under the legislation they would be deemed to be and so the the person who makes the judgment um it depends on the setting they're in and whether that then has implications for you of whether it, it seems fit for consumption or not so I think that's why we're concerned about that part of this legislation and how it might negatively impact on things that just don't look the same as it does in coals because it's not that kind of food. So it won't be post-production like in once it's on the shelf, it'll be literally when the auditor walks into your wash pack room and says that doesn't look fit for human consumption. Potentially. That's yeah. the risk. Yeah. Yeah, I think. Braden? Hi. Uh, yeah, uh, just on that point as well, I know it's a little bit off from where we're going, but regarding that, where would we, or is it something that we need to look at writing in um, a point of recourse or dispute for, uh, for an audit? Um, I, I assume that they're done through shy councils. I think that's how I read how I read um, their statement. So for Sans where, where can we take if if we get somebody who's unreasonable? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, where do is there a process that is written in that we can take thereafter? So I my understanding, Braden, is that that will come in with the states working out their implementation plans, and there will be. Probably this will be, well, not probably, it might be devolved to councils and environmental health officers, but it might not. It might sit with um, like agriculture departments uh, or health departments for that matter. So I think the states have some leeway because they all administer law differently um, depending on the state. So we're not sure who actually would hold that responsibility. That'll be part of, we hope, the discussions in the consultation process for the next two years. To determine who that should be so it's a good question so two questions you just asked actually where one is you know who's going to be doing this and the second is what's what's the um dispute resolution so those are questions we need to take into our consultations with the state governments and i think 
Mel had a question, no, comment in here, um, has shared a, a document there on food safety guidelines and saying that they could have used some food safety guidance at startup phase, especially like what are some of the sources of biological contamination? Um, and funding would ideally be offered to assist smallholders financially in setting up suitable facilities. Yeah, I mean, question is, are your facilities not already suitable? I suspect that they are. <laughs> so um, if they're going to require something more and more expensive, then that's a different matter, isn't it? I think we're going to try and hold a line that says you shouldn't have to. And Lachlan, I've been advised by my local council that I require a food business license or package cut greens under the Food Act and... Oh, and they said it wasn't within their remit. Um, sprouts, eggs, and meat are all definitely regulated in that way. We're hearing in Victoria con conflicting information from uh, smallholders, and bagged lettuce seems to be a big one, where some councils, like at farmers markets, people are being um, given a hard time about whether they do that, and in others, they're not. So what, what are your experiences around bag lettuce? Is, is it like that, sort of inconsistent? Yeah. Well, we can, um, one thing we can do like fairly quickly, because there's already, if there's existing legislation that's giving EHOs the opportunity to say that you should, you have to have some other um, regime in place to be able to bag your lettuce. We'll just find out whether that's already the case. Um, I'm not sure that it is really in, in most states, though. Do people like Chris and Helen, do you know um, in Victoria if there are any rules around bagged lettuce here? I think there is street trader certifications for having bagged lettuce. Uh, on your stall um, and then that requires perhaps uh, certain conditions and this is where it was bagged right um yeah. so they're doing it under street trader so it's at the point of sale that they're regulating that yeah i mean possibly councils could inspect um at any time i'm not sure the um, premises How about in New South Wales, um, Fraser and Kirsty or anyone else, do you know? Uh, we have no issue in Northern Rivers with bag lettuce. We've no. only had the food safety, sorry. Okay. Oh, we've only, we've had the food safety handler come around to the market a few times, but he's mainly checking, uh, you know, if you've got an open watermelon. Right. Or a pumpkin. It needs to be wrapped up, not never a salad bag. Right. So and from, from how I understand it, we're required to be a registered food business and that potentially they could examine the premises if they if there was an issue, but that just doesn't happen. Right. Have to be a registered that, food business, like not a not a temporary permit like we have at Street Trader. You're actually meant to be a registered food business. Yeah. Yeah, we had to do, we had to do like a food certificate course. Yeah, which was and then that required well that enabled us to be a food a registered food business. And we were nervous that because our farm is or not nervous because our practices are fine, but like we're like oh we should probably get the certificate because we're on the highway and someone might just rock up, but no one has. Right. Um, and yeah, bagged lettuce is like one of our biggest. I don't know most like that's one of our biggest kind of products. And yeah, I've never heard anything about policies or regulations around that here either so yeah no well I think it's probably also it's sort of rearing its head because you've got these really long supply chains and you've got bagged lettuce sitting in coals and woolies that have been there for you know god knows how long since it came from the farm um, and then we've had some outbreaks and so now I think probably um, I, I'm guessing that there'd be council officers who are feeling nervous about that when they see bagged lettuce at a farmer's market because they're associating them, even though we know they're very different products and their time from farm to eater is much, much shorter. We are um, 
a very new market garden and um, been trying to get to the bottom of whether we need a food license for selling bagged lettuce because it's, you know, such a key crop. We really want to be able to do it. But I found it super confusing as to what we need, whether we need to be a licensed food business. Um, and I spoke with the DPI sort of thing. So this is New South Wales. And the impression I got was that we do, but I was quite confused about it because the way the legislation seems to be set out is that the determinant of trigger is the, the extra cut post-harvest, but you don't extra cut bagged lettuce except harvest. So that was very confusing. Um, and then to try and figure out, you know, if we do need a license, how do we meet the conditions of getting a license was even more confusing. And it was sort of indicated that the wash pack had to be entirely enclosed, which is something that at the moment we can't achieve. So yeah, just really confused. <laughs> Yeah. So in what state were you in, Taylor? New South Wales. You're in New South Wales as well. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, we've got, um, we're, we've been working on the legal guide for the last uh, six, nine months, I think. And I, I don't think we've, we, we have some things around the um, standards applying to horticulture, but I don't think we've looked into specifically what's happening with bagged lettuce. And it seems to be an issue for most small market gardeners. If like, if there is a, a, regulation that you didn't know you were needing to meet and if so how do you do it so we can make that a priority to research before the 2025 question like what's going on right now so we can reduce uncertainty for members that'd be awesome yeah we'll get the get the wonderful paralegals onto that project they'll love it <laughs> and then compost god i'm looking at from ruby Yeah, I think that's 55 for nine days sounds right to me. I think that's what we got from the EPA website on compost. Right. Wooter? That was me, the compost garden? No. Oh. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think the, uh, sorry to go back on the uh, on the lettuce. The main thing it seems to be is the, uh, whether you're cutting it again, same here in Tasmania, the cut lettuce, um, like a salad mix or so, is generally considered of a risk when you post harvest cutting it. But um, if you're saying doing a baby green directly, you're not in theory cutting it again. And that's a pretty good way to get around to, to the legislation, I think. Even if you are, say, having a whole head which you're cutting to pieces, um you could do that on the field or you have it in theory done on the field as well there's, there's a few ways to get around it yeah, I, 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 yeah but i guess probably what you're trying to achieve really is is to make sure that whatever you're doing is the safest way and yeah. and that might be like that might be it but um i we need to demonstrate that um all of the practices that you are trying to follow are you know totally safe and, and best practice and we need to stop them having a the wrong spot where they regulate which which you can just go back upstream from to to get around when actually what we want to achieve is super safe food which is what you're all working towards anyway um but that's interesting too like if they're just getting it at the wrong point of the chain then that's silly and we should probably point that out yeah, I'm not sure how to go around, but I just want to mention that there's often that slight difference in whether you cut it. There's actually a very little difference whether you cut it on the spot or and another cut a few centimeters up again later. There's little difference, but that's where the where the letters of the legislation make the difference. Yeah, right, that's what I wanted to add. To you. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um... And Chloe, I saw your uh, your comment as well about um, a fully enclosed wash pack uh, shed would be really hard for heaps of the small scale market gardeners. Um, like it's you know it's all just more capital outlay, right? That usually, especially a startup market garden, isn't going to be able to just enclose a shed. Um, but we'd want to see some really strong evidence about why that would make the food so much safer. 
you know, when you when you do as so many of you do, you harvest in the morning and it's it's on its way to the market that afternoon or the or the night before and in the morning, like when it's that shorter time frame, um, what is the actual purpose of a fully enclosed, super sterile uh packing shed? I don't think that's that's yeah, it seems unnecessary. Chloe, did you want to say something? I you were on mute. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, and for us, like we're farming on like floodplain land, we're actually not allowed to build anything, and we've got shipping containers on the property. Yeah, um, but that's already sort of skirting our council regulations. Like, yeah, anything more permanent, it's just yeah, not not doable here. No, and we know there's an increasing number of smallholders that are managing to land share in these kind of environments. And so making it impossible for more temporary um, equipment like setup is, is going to hinder the movement of people who are trying to farm who can't afford land because it's too stupidly expensive. So, yeah, those are all points that we'll make to the governments as well. I mean, again, we just, one thing we always do in our submissions is, and, and in this kind of consultation work is come back to them and say, show us the evidence for why you think this should happen. Because quite often um, they don't have a good evidence base for why they want to increase the, um, yeah, how onerous the requirements are. You know, like the impact of ducks, you know, wild ducks on um, the safety of things. <laughs> it's like, don't blame this one on the ducks. It's, it's somebody else's fault, this system problem. Other particular concerns there of existing um, uncertainty on regulations or uh, with the with the standards? The standards are quite short to read. I do recommend having a look at those. I think that um, Jess put the link in the reminder email for you. Um, because you can always send through concerns um, as well, if you if you haven't looked at them closely yet, and chlorinated water for some jurisdictions, yeah, um, yeah, I'm definitely not <laughs> personally supportive of chlorinated water for our vegetables. Um, we'll keep an eye out for that sort of treatment question of the water. Obviously, it needs to be clean and potable water, but it doesn't have to be chlorinated to be that. Um, no, so to answer Alison and Michael. The, the differing regulations currently in horticulture at scale are that because the, the large scale ones are selling into supermarkets and wholesalers and long chains, they're usually, almost all of them are under some sort of QA program that the industry sets up, but they're not regulated any more differently than you are in terms of the government's approach. So this is partially the government saying, well, we might like to regu regulate this more closely. And this is what often happens to smallholders um, in all forms of food production, where they say, we're going to fix an industrial problem. And what they do is they squash a non-industrial movement you know, of, of growers. So it's often an unintended effect. And fortunately, AFSA has been working with state and local governments and a little bit federal uh, for a decade. So now th there is a voice for smallholders now to say, hang on, hang on, before you implement this, realize what it's going to do to smallholders. And I know some market gardeners. Thanks. Is, is there a way, like, uh, are you guys going to come back to them with something like a submission? Yeah. So is there a way to sort of highlight, I guess, the differences between small scale market gardening and the larger scale agriculture and have them hopefully, you know, maybe make some sort of delineation in the legislation for Absolutely. that? Yeah. Like, yeah like, so so that's side. one of the, what we're going to do after, from, from here um, after like in the next month, what we'd like to do is run a survey of members and that's going to survey questions like the land size that you're working, what your um, fertility inputs are and where they come from and uh, your water source, what your, what, what your wash up stations do look like. Um, and this can be de-identified for how it goes to the government. We just want to understand it ourselves. Um, and then the questions around how you sell the produce and and like how long it is from harvest to sale so that we can show them, you know, that we're not just saying this, this is how it is. Um, so that'll happen as a survey. Then next month, there'll be the members session where it'll be kind of a focus group. So we'll take a lot of those survey responses 
and then we'll be in the session with um, all the members who are able to come and we'll get more information and more detail and we'll form formulate some case studies from that so that we can show the government exactly what our systems look like and why they should be regulated differently because the scale and risk is so much lower. Um, and they, I know Victoria hasn't even started their consultation process. I actually saw one of the people who will be involved in it at a biosecurity meeting a couple of months ago. And she said, we'll definitely be in touch with AFSA when we start the consultation process. But right now we're, we're trying to design it. We don't know what it looks like because they've got two years till implementation, but they're worried. They're worried that it's going to have a negative impact and they, they want to figure out what they can do to not squeeze smallholders out with this new standards. If you so, yeah, that's right. So selling into supermarkets has their own. But like I said, you know, several of those outbreaks came from systems with supermarket QA systems. So they're not, the problem isn't whether you're being QA'd, it's how you're producing food and how long it is before people get to eat it, right? It's a major part of the problem. Other concerns or comments? Otherwise... I might just then tell you about what we're going to do for next steps. Um, so the plan is Eliza, who's here from Borrowed Ground, is going to lead that focus group session next month after we will have done a survey over the next month, um, a very short survey. We just want to get a good snapshot of the difference in size and practices of what people are doing. And you'll have an option to be identified or not identified. Um, we certainly don't intend to send this data with identification to the government, um, but for our own benefit to be able to follow up with you for case studies, it could be useful to have your um, farms attached to it. And then, yeah, we'll be involved in the ongoing consultations and the standards come into effect in January, 2025, but we don't know what that means as we just discussed, like how, what it'll actually look like. Um, so I just know I always have to finish with a collectivized sort of reminder because the the only reason that we can do what we do is because we have members and we tell the government we have several number, the, this number of members and that this is an actual existing sector of agriculture that needs to be um, considered when they make legislative changes. And so if you're not already a member, we certainly recommend that you do. The other thing we'll do in this month before... Um, before the next session where we do the deeper dive into the systems is uh, we're, we're currently working on the people's food plan, updating it from the original people's food plan that we founded AFSA on in 2012. And it's, it's in a pretty exciting and massive document. It's been a process of nine months of drafting and consultation with members um, based on 10 years of submissions to government. So it's like, there's a lot in it. But we'll send it to all of you um, to be able to have a look in case some of the food safety section in particular triggers some thoughts for you about, oh, well, what is it I need to be thinking about in terms of how the regulations might affect me or that already do. Um, and then we also, like I said, have the legal guide coming out soon. That won't be members only. We got some funding from Sustainable Table to enable us to finish that and get it out to the public. And so it's pretty exciting that we can just make that publicly available. Um, we hope people would still choose to to join because, you know, we're all volunteers doing this, except Jess, who keeps us all together. Um, and we couldn't do a lot of the work we do without membership. Well, we're entirely membership, except for like that, that grant recently. Um, you also, if you're a member, can access our legal advice. So if you were working on a food safety plan in uh, the Northern Rivers and you weren't sure what was required, you could actually contact us through the uh, Legal Defense Fund and one of our paralegals would get back to you and provide you with some advice. We do a lot of advice around um, land use planning in particular, because we have a lot of planning issues amongst our members. And then I know there's a, a disproportionate number of land sharers amongst, um, amongst market gardeners. So we also have the Farming on Other People's Land program that provides advice for land sharing. And if you haven't read Farming Democracy, which has been out for a few years now, um, I certainly recommend it. There's some fantastic market gardeners in there, including some who are here tonight. Um, it's nice to see Mel and Deck here. I can't see who's where on the screen anymore, but um, yeah, it's, and actually where's Fraser and Kirsty? They, they're in the book as well. So if you want to just learn more about their systems and um, the, including farming democracy, hello, 
farming democracy also um includes financials about uh, all the farms so it told we told everybody how much it's costing us and how much we're earning from farming so it's not only things like dealing with regulation you can learn more about other people's farming systems if you haven't already read the book and somebody saying melons had nothing to do with the quality of the farm itself dust from a feedlot mm. interesting is that the one though that was one of them was a, a rock melon farm up in the territory that was like thousands of hectares of rock melons so that still sounds problematic to me I don't I can't imagine thousands of hectares of a melon just doesn't seem smart anyway that's me yep yeah, exactly are there other questions or comments? Um, also, we're interested in your thoughts about like in preparing for the session in May, if you have ideas about what we should be making sure we gather in terms of information, um, you can tell us in advance, you can send us an email, you can give us a call, or you can turn up in May and um, and share your thoughts there. Um, it, all of this is meant to be a people's food plan kind of approach. So your input is incredibly valuable. You're the experienced ones in the field, literally. Wow, we gave you enough information. Did I overwhelm you with information? I hope not. <laughs> uh, how are berries implicated? Um, yeah, it's so dumb, Helen. It's from the imported berries that where the outbreaks came from. That's why berries have been drawn into this. From, yeah, from berries that weren't grown here um, and, and mostly weren't packaged here either. So... It's, but the berries you're growing here are the ones that will be impacted by the new standards. Don't don't look for too much sense in government. It's <laughs> drive you crazy. Um, uh, if a license is required, so I'm going to answer Jay's question um, about if a license required, can people just donate for lettuce instead of buying it? No, in, in Australia, and like in America, where they do a lot of those workarounds, you know, Joel Salatin and others talk about these kind of um, loopholes that they they use. In Australia, most of our legislation has nothing to do with commerce. So you actually, the things are illegal just because they're illegal. So for example, um, if we kill an animal here and you want to, and you, you're part of that system and then you take it away, that's still illegal, even if you didn't pay anything for that. Um, raw milk, same thing. You don't have to sell it. You could own the cow and come over and milk it here. If you take it off the property, it's now that's illegal. So um, it's not usually about uh, commerce. It's about the site of production and leaving the site of production that makes it illegal. And someone else had something, sorry. It is too early, Ben. We don't know. Um, and we know from their own documentation that they are open to the idea of a fee-free threshold. So that is, I mean, that in itself would be obviously positive for smallholders, but we're still concerned about um, the auditing process and the, the kind of onerous nature of paperwork for a registration. So we would be wanting to keep that as simplified as possible, which is what we won with the pastured pig and poultry reforms, basically just simplified uh, paperwork and we did not win a reduced fee though we have to pay the same as a shed with ten thousand pigs i think in market gardening we'll have a better chance of winning the fee free threshold to be honest josh did you have something yeah i was just thinking like <clears throat> market gardeners and especially small scale kind of veggie growers seem to operate in isolation a lot um i think it's probably a good Point in time to collectivize a bit and start to represent our small scale farming industry. Um, so stuff like this, it's probably good to start to tell your circles wherever you are across Australia to get on board and, and start to understand um, a bit more of the nitty gritty about where we're heading and the challenges we're going to face. So yeah, just time to kind of band together and, and tell the other growers what's going on. Yeah, for sure. Um... Yeah, and it's. I think it's just going to get sort of worse. So the more we collectivize, the more we can hold hold lines to not let it get worse. Um, 
and yeah, cost of compliance. I agree, Ryan. And great, great to hear that Richard's going to be joining AFSA. Uh, yes, so it will apply to Asian greens. Anything, anything that will be uh, that's consumed fresh. Any of the leafy greens that are consumed fresh, uh, like uh, primarily. So I think it says like things like broccoli, so brassicas, things that we usually cook, will be are not um, part of this. But the lettuces that you normally eat fresh, or you, that you might cook, but you also eat fresh. They're the ones that are being caught up in the leafy greens. There is a description of it in the standard, which is 4.2.8. Um, it does say which ones they're talking about. Have we made Mel laugh? Sorry, I was meant to, I was going to write, write out the leafy veg that was, un, that was, <laughs> <laughs> but I pressed enter way too soon and it sent just lettuce. So the leafy veg that um, they're talking about are lettuce, leafy salad veg, herbs, cabbage, English spinach, silver beet, kale, and leafy Asian veg as well. So it's it's a big chunk of what yeah. we're all growing. Yeah. It is quite Not just lettuce. <laughs> no. <laughs> um. Yeah, all, I don't know, Helen. I think, I don't know if it's all, I think it's just all lettuce, actually, or all leafy greens. I don't think it's necessary. At this stage, the standard doesn't dictate um, how it's treated. It's just that it exists, that it will come under the standard. But then again, this is the matter for the states, right, to work out their implementation of, so then what will need to be um, monitored and recorded? they'll have to decide which part of the system they're concerned about you monitoring and recording and reporting on. And so that's, yeah, that's our job in the consultations is to, to make sure that we understand from all of you, what are the bits that are, that are pretty easy for you to say, oh, that could be risky. And I'm happy to, you know, provide some kind of report on that. Um, and which bits are like, no, that's ridiculous. That's a terrible use of our time because it's not, it's not a safety risk. Um, that's the information we'll, we'll need to collect from all of you in more detail. And one of the things my experience of all these years of farming and dealing with food safety um, in our own burning room, not being afraid of saying where you think there are the risks, you know, acknowledging where you think there are mi microbiological risks to your, in your system and, and how you manage them, because risks are everywhere and we manage them all the time. Um, and there's nothing wrong with acknowledging that. And, you know, if, if you're applying animal manures, there should be withholding periods or treatment, heat treatment or something, you know, there's time or heat basically, right? Um, and so I'm sure that people are doing those things because that's how you keep safe, uh, food safe. So we shouldn't pretend that we don't have to do things to keep it safe. Um, we just don't want to be made to do things that are not good use of your time, which I know is already limited for hardworking market gardeners. Um, to prove that you, that it's safe. You should be able to have a plan that is accepted, that they know you follow that plan, that you don't have to report on it constantly. That would be kind of the simplest, right? How many get your dam bore or tank water tested more than once a year for fecal coliforms? Anyone? No? I wouldn't be surprised if water testing um, is one of the things they're going to be expecting. You know, it's certainly for the burning. We have to test our tank water every three months um, for E. coli. Two times in 18 months, once in two years, or once in 20 years? <laughs> Greek fed yeah yeah I guess that one's to my mind you know that is one of the the fair concerns though because of the risk of E. coli in water um and and something that's a ready to eat food we're required to test it even though meat gets cooked 
you know, like, like, and we don't wash the meat. It's just washing the benches and things. Um, but we're required to, even though our food is then cooked. So with lettuces that aren't cooked, if you're washing with dirty water, obviously that's, that's a genuine risk. Um, so how you make sure you don't have dirty water, whether it's testing or whether you've got other means of ensuring you've got really clean water, you know, there's an argument that there's more than one way, but yeah, clean water seems pretty important. It's particularly at wash up. Yeah, no, it's not uh, just about package screens. I have a question. Yeah. About like um if if you wash the vegetable and then like um you put on the package, say wash it yourself, is that past the regulations of like if the person takes on their responsibility to make sure that that vegetable is clean? Is that part? That's a good question um, that I don't, well, I don't think they have an answer to right now uh, because they haven't decided whether to make sure that the produce is sold in, a, in an acceptable um, state. They haven't decided whether that will mean also testing your water or um, testing soil and things. That's not, we don't know the details yet. Um, whether you can put that on the eater and be sure that it's going to be clean if somebody's actually using contaminated water is that even sufficient for them to wash it at the other end um, so I think these are the kind of questions they're going to be going through in that chain of events like what are the likely sources of contamination are they being managed well um, and yeah then and then I think I mean like um, sorry to cut you off but like I think then from like time to consumption is like the main point isn't it really like if we can say that our customers are eating it within seven days or in one day, you know, like most of our customers do do, like they buy it and then they eat it. It's not sitting there for so long to start the contamination. You know, it's, the, the sitting around is the problem. Right. This is where food safety stuff also gets really complicated though, because also in, people often contaminate it in their own homes. They contaminate it on the drive home. They contaminate it by leaving it in the fridge drawer for seven days. You know, so so actually at at home is where quite a lot of food safety um, issues occur, and it's not from the side of production and distribution. So this is it's a really complex area to um, protect everyone in the system from the farmer to the eater, and make sure that um, everybody has good food safety knowledge and practices. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think there's pretty Good information around these days that people should even if you buy bagged lettuce you should wash your lettuce right that's a that's a general rule of thumb um because not just because it uh, of the contamination question but because when you put something in an anaerobic environment you create better conditions for things to grow so um that sort of advice is good to give to the people eating your food anyway but i don't know if the regulator would find that sufficient it'll it remains to be seen Okay, well, I hope that we brought you promising news that we're on this <laughs> and we're going to do our best to make sure that there are not a bunch of serious um, implications for all of you doing such wonderful work feeding your local communities. Um, and we will hammer the point about direct supply chains and the healthy nature of the ecosystems that you manage. You know, like we've got you back on this for sure. And um, the more information you can provide about what your systems look like when we survey you, the, the better for us to be able to show them that we're not making it up how small these, these sort of market gardens are, how, how quickly people are being fed, um, and the precautions you are taking to keep your eaters safe because you have a pretty vested interest in not making people sick. Um, but they don't, they don't like that comment. They're like, oh, Nobody wants to make anybody sick. And it's like, okay, but the industrial system is all the time. We literally are trying not to. <laughs> We're pushing back against that system. Um, so keep doing all of the good work you're doing. And hopefully we can keep this from being a, a disaster that it would have been if there was nobody, no organization like AFSA, you know? All right. Well, I'm gonna go to I'm gonna go to dinner unless somebody has any other questions.
I think I might have some tumpanieri growers produce that I need to eat shortly. Don't you think, Rex? <laughs> Thanks, Tammy Rock. <laughs> Thank you. And Eliza will be your will be your guide in May. Um, able to talk the nitty gritty of market gardeners, uh, market gardening with market gardeners. Yeah. Um, I'll just be a spectator at that one. Yeah. So take some time to really think about, yeah, what like your context and we can all band together and um, yeah, build a really strong campaign against this because it would be a pain in the ass if it went through. Yeah. And tell your mates. Yeah. T- spread the word. Yeah. <laughs> Job. Viva! <laughs> Thanks, everyone. And it's we'll time to watch month. the seven thirty.